All right, last time we let off with uh, talking about how to log on. And there is built-in controls to log on, but I wanted to go over how to do it by yourself because I wanted to uh, show you how to write SQL statements um, that were um, not associated, well, well, I was going to say not associated with objects, where, where you didn't like just drag and drop. In other words, you had to write the code to create the, uh, uh, the um, uh, connection and the SQL data source and you manually did the query and then used the results for something. So, once you've logged on, what do you want to do? The other thing that we did is that we stored who was logged on in a session variable. Now in this example, um, we're saying that the only people that log on are administrators. So, regular users don't have a logon. All right, so that's the assumption for this particular example. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow reg, we're going to allow administrators to actually update the database. All right, uh, and we're going to do this through an application. All right, we're going to do it through our application, but we want to make sure that people um, that aren't administrators can't do the updates. How do you think we're going to do that? How are we going to make sure that people that aren't administrators we're going to create a page that will allow someone, for example, to add a new specialty pizza. Um, how are we going to create it? How are we going to make it such that people that aren't administrators can't go and do that? So you have to be logged on to add a specialty pizza. We know that we have the user ID that they're logged in on as a session variable. How are we going to use that information to keep people from um, that are not administrators from going in and changing. Yes? Can we make it so that only certain like, pages or buttons will appear depending on the password? Okay, excellent. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure that, um, number one, we're going to make sure that the link doesn't appear if they're not logged on. All right? So on the page that has the list of specialty pizzas, We're going to have a link that says add pizza. Or we can make it a button or we can make it a link or something like that. All right. Are we going to do, and, and then if you click that link, you'll go to a page that allows you to insert a specialty pizza. All right. So what we'll do is, wait a minute. Oh, darn. Oh, yeah, you just can't see. What we'll do is we'll enable and disable this button based on whether they're logged on. So we'll make it visible, we'll make it invisible based on whether they're logged on or not. All right. But that's not enough. Why is that not enough? Is clicking the link the only way to get to that page? No. What's another way to get to that page? Type in the exact URL. Is someone going to know the URL of that page? No. But they could guess, or they could try possibilities, or whatever. So let's say, this page has a name addpizza.aspx. We cannot show this link, all right? But if someone types in addpizza.aspx on our website, they'll go to that page and they'll be able to go and add it. So this is a good start, but we need to do more. So what are we going to do here? What are we going to do on this page to keep people that are not logged on from going in and adding data to the database. Well, we know who's logged on based on the session variables, right? 
So there's either something in the session variable or there's not something in the session variable. So that gives us the knowledge to do that. All right? So what can we do on this page? What would we like to do? That's, that's, that's sometimes a good approach. Instead of thinking what we can do, think of what you'd like to do. What would you like to have happen if a non-logged on user happened to stumble across this page? Block them. And do what? Maybe. Maybe we could display a message that says this is not a valid page. All right? What? Yes? Can we redirect them to the homepage? Redirect them to the homepage or redirect them to the logon page. All right? That's what I think I would want to have happen. Because what if, for example, there is a legitimate user who navigates to that page and they didn't realize they weren't logged on? You know, their session expired or they had it bookmarked or something like that. So if they were to go to this page and they weren't logged on, I would like them to get redirected to the login page. All right. We know if they're logged in or not based on that session variable. So that solves part of the problem. All right. Where are we going to put that code? When do we want that code to execute? As soon as the page loads. Right? So it will be the page load event. All right. So again, what I'm trying to do, I think it's valuable to take a few minutes, and I try to do this in class, and you should do it when you get an assignment, to think through, and like I said before, take inventory of the stuff that you know and the stuff that you don't know. We know how to show and hide things, right? We did that in lab two. We showed, sh show, showed, shown? What's the right verb there? We showed? Showed. 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 It just doesn't sound right. We showed different panels depending on if they're logged in or not. Okay, so fine. We know how to do that. Um, we know how to take a link and send it to this page. We know what variable is used to determine if they're logged on. Really, the only things that we don't know, there's two things that we don't know. One is how to redirect them. It's a one-liner, all right? It's a one-liner, so not that big a deal at all. And we don't know how to do the insert. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're first going to do the redirection bit because we're kind of on a roll with the session variable thing from last time. And then we're going to talk about the um, inserts. When we do inserts, we'll take a few minutes just to talk about the insert instruction by itself. All right? Then we will talk about how to use it within this context. We're going to hand code this insert. You can do inserts off of details views. You cannot do inserts off of grid views. All right? But I'm going to hand code, hand code this one anyhow, again, for the reasons that I talked about last time. It's good to know a couple ways to do things. There's something a little quirky about this one that leads me to want to take this approach with this. And we'll talk about that when we come to it. All right. So let's go and pick up where we left off last time. someone got a picture if not we can we can do that after class <laughs>
seven emails. Oh my goodness, I should just go home right after class today. <laughs> I think I need some rest before I deal with all those. see the cruel person here today. The person who said they were going to email me something when I complained about not getting any emails. They said they were going to send me an email reminding me that Dobby was still dead from Harry Potter. <laughs> because I really took that hard. I really did. And this person, who shall be nameless, um, but we do know that they're not here. All right, so that's not be named. He should, should not be named, yeah. Um, uh, mentioned that uh, they were just going to randomly email me, Dobby's still dead. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where people get so mean. <laughs> That's like, have you ever read like things that people do to their sims? Like they like lock them up in rooms where there's no way to get out and stuff, you know? It's, it's like, what, you know? That's, that's frightening that these people are walking about. All right, let's look at the login page. All right, what's different from this, from all the other ones, is that we wrote the code to actually do the login instead of just dragging and dropping and configuring the data source. So we programmatically, through our code, created these things. So let's look at the code behind. That's where most of the action is. Uh, on the page itself, really not much to speak of. Two text boxes for username and password and a login button. So when they click the button, we create our SQL data source object. Keep in mind that the steps here are virtually identical to the steps that we do when we configure it by dragging and dropping. Because that's really what you're doing when you're dragging and dropping, is you're sort of writing this sort of code. It's just like doing it for you. So the first step when we create our data source object, what is the first step? Is to identify the connection string. And we need two parts of the connection string, the provider name and the connection string itself. Both of these are in the web config file. This is how we access the web config file. We look under the connection strings for our connection string that we named it. We grab the provider name and we grab the connection string. And we set these two properties of the data source. We then, we then supply, and again, that's what we do when we create one using the screen, right? First thing we do is we pick our data source. Then we define our select command. In our case, I say select user info ID, first name, last name from user info, where username equals question mark and password equals question mark. So we're going to see what they type in, if that corresponds to a user or not. All right. What does that mean to correspond to a user? It means that if there is a user in the database that matches that user ID and password, we will return one row. We know that we will return only one row because user ID is unique. So it can't be two people that have the same user ID. There could be one or there could be none. And it's not just user ID. We're looking for a user ID and the password matching what we have. All right. So even if they get the right username, if the password doesn't match, then this will return no rows. So this statement is either going to return one row or zero rows. One row means that there is um, 
you know, that there's someone that matches the, the username and password. Zero rows, rows means that there's no one that matches it, that either the password or the user ID was wrong. All right, what do we do on the very next screen if we're, if we're configuring it uh, that way? We say where the parameters come from. Remember, the parameters are going to get filled in at runtime. We don't know what username and password we're looking for. It just depends on what they type in the screen. So we define, and we define those parameters this way. So the username, which is the first parameter, comes from the text box named username. And the password comes from the text box password. These lines here are creating for us a place to put the results of the query. Actually, that's what this line does. The, well, these two lines configure how we're going to access the data. This line says what mode we're going in. And we're using a data reader. Um, simply put, a data reader is the simpler of the alternatives. A data reader allows you just to read through sequentially. What do I mean by read sequentially? Get the first row in the result set, get the second row, get the third row, and so far, so far down the line. Now we only have one thing though, right? Remember, we only are we only going to return at most one row. So we don't need to sequentially read through a bunch of rows, we just need to grab the first row. This statement here actually performs the quer uh, query and puts the results in an iData reader, which is like a table, which is like a, a table, like an Excel spreadsheet where there are rows and columns, called my data. We then read the next row, all right? And since we're at the very beginning of it, the next row is the first row. Either the first row is there, or it's not there, right? If it's there, it means that we have successfully logged in because we found a match for the username and password. If it's not there, it means that we have not logged in correctly. So if it finds something, then we have a winner, all right? If not, then something's wrong. Either the user ID doesn't match or the password doesn't match or both don't match. <coughs> If it, <coughs> excuse me, if we successfully log in, then we store these values in a session variable. The user ID, the first name, and the last name. And we, I just for the heck of it, I just displayed on the label saying that it was a successful login. So let's look at our database real quick. I'm going to look at my user info table. Username of Mike, password of password. All right. So I'm going to log in. I'm going to set that as the start page. Again, use ID of Mike, password of password, log in, and we successfully logged in. Now if we go to one of the other pages, I forget which pages I made the change on, but on one of the other pages, yeah, this one, it says my name on the top. So it knows that I have logged in successfully. And again, it doesn't matter where we bounce around to. As long as that session is active, then um, it's going to remember that I'm logged in. How long will the session be active? Well, it depends on the session timeout period. By default, I think it is 20 minutes. I think that's the default. But you can control that and you can change it. You could also make it where it would explicitly log out. 
there is, uh, and, and we'll at some point we'll, we'll do this. I don't know if we'll do this today or not, but you can issue a very simple command called session.abandon, and session abandon uh, logs you out. All right? Okay. So, to redirect is easy. In fact, the code was there, it was just commented out. To redirect to a page automatically, we simply say response, redirect, and then they have the name of the URL. So after they've logged on, I'm going to send them to the list of specialty pizzas. In all of web programming, there, there's no, pretty much regardless of the language, there's going to be two objects um, that every web development program I've worked on, every web server-side solution I've worked on, has two objects, at least two objects. That is request and response. All right? So request is the server grabbing information from the client. Response is the server telling the client to do something. So from client to server is a request. From server to client is a response. In this case, I want to send the browser, which is the client, to a certain page. Well, therefore, it's a response. If I want to pull a value from the query string, that would be request. Okay? So, again, think if it's coming from the client or, go, or coming from the server. If it's going to the uh, client or going to the server. So now if I do this, it's automatically going to take me there. And I go right there. So that indicates that I've logged on. All right. Okay, cool. Let's create the add link on that list page. I'm going to go to that ad page, and I'm going to go and we're stuck with this again, huh? Wow. Well, we know the solution for that. Maybe. again. Hopefully we've got our toolbar this time, toolbox. So I'm going to put on here a link to add pizza. So my hypertext link, my text is going to be add pizza. My navigate URL is going to be add pizza. that 
that if the person's not logged on. So I'm going to go into the load, page load, and I'm going to say, Session first name equals null. So there's nothing there. Then I'm going to go hide that link. is called hyperlink one dot visible equals false. All right, let's test this out. All right, let's go and log on and we should be able to see the link. If we're not logged on, we should not be able to see the link. Okay, we are not logged on, and we don't see the link. That's right. That says label up there. We should probably fix that. Yeah. Label simply means there's nothing in the session variable, so it doesn't show the user ID. Let's go and log on now. And we do see the link. And we see the person's name. Okay, yes. so that's how we can hide that page. All right, or hide that link rather. Now that we have the session variable, if they're logged in, um, we can, uh, you know, we can do some great things. I'm using the first name. Uh, the ID would probably work just as well. Uh, let me go and blank out that. All right. So now I'm going to create the add pizza page. And I'm not going to write the logic for this page yet. I'm just going to make sure that you can't get to it if you're not logged in. So I'm just going to put an H1 here that says add pizza. All right. But I'm going to go here, and in the page load event, if they are not logged in, I'm going to send them to the login page. How do we know if they're logged in or not? Well, we've already seen that code. We look to see if one of the session variables equals null. I'm going to use first name because the first name is required, so everyone has to have one unless they're not logged in. So, in the page load event, I'm going to say if session first name equals null, then I'm going to do what? Redirect them to the login page. How do we redirect them? Response.redirect. Response, we should know that even if we don't remember the redirect command, right? Because this is something that the server is telling the client to do. So this, this command is going, this information is going from the server. to the client. Therefore, it is response. All right? Redu uh, uh, request is where we're looking at data coming from the client. So if we wanted to pull, for example, values from the query string, if we wanted to pull uh, the kind of computer the person was on, 
All those things would be via the request. But if they're not logged on, I'm going to say response. Redirect. And I'm going to send them to the login page. That should be in quotes. All right. So I'm going to set the login page as a home page. If I type in that URL before I've logged on, something didn't work. Well, that's not good. Well, that's right, right? Well, You're you didn't go, go to the Add Pizza one. Pardon me? You didn't go to the Add Pizza page. He's right. Oh. Uh, list page. Yeah, he's I went right. to the list page. You're right. Add Pizza. Thank you. Oh, yeah, wrong page, right. I was starting to question my Jedi powers here. <laughs> so I should type in add pizza, not list. Because, right, regular users can go to the list page. They just shouldn't have, in fact, let's go and do that. They just shouldn't have that link, which they don't. Okay, that's legit. Is this one of those cases that I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken? Uh, anyhow, let's try to go to the add pizza page. And boom, we get redirected to the login page. So yay, that worked. Um, if we successfully log in now, we have the link, it remembers who we are, and boom, we're on the Add Pizza page. So we're gonna use those session variables to determine if they're logged on or not. And based on that, we can do a lot of different stuff. We can we can redirect them somewhere if they're not supposed to, uh, and so on. All right, questions about this? All right, next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about insert statements into the database. All right, this is a new kind of SQL statement. So before we write the page, I want to take a minute to talk about the insert statement in SQL. Forgetting about ASP, forgetting about ASP.NET for the moment, and then we will look at um, um, how to do this in ASP.NET. Okay. one table. We'll cover all of these 
over the next couple days. And again, one thing to remember, by the way, is your design is due next week, I believe, for your database project. Now, I've had people in the past say, and it's kind of fair, that we don't know how to do some of this stuff yet. We'll just trust that you will know how to insert, update, and delete. All right, we're going to know how to insert this week. Update and delete is very similar. So design it, even though you may not necessarily know exactly the code to do it. All right. An insert statement looks like this. And there's actually a couple different forms of the insert statement. We're going to cover the one that's most relevant to us here. It looks like this. Insert into whatever the name of the table is. A list of columns and then a list of values. All right. So pretty simple. In in, in a lot of respects, it's simpler than the select because there's not not at least in this version of the insert, there's like not a lot of clauses, right? This is what you have. You're going to insert into a table. Here's the columns that you're inserting into. Here are the values that you're going to give. So let's look what is in our specialty pizza table. Let me look at that. Our specialty pizza table has specialty pizza ID, specialty pizza name, pizza image, and a user info ID. All right. So I want to record who has entered that data. All right. So there's the following things. Specialty pizza ID, specialty pizza name, image name, and user info ID. Are we going to include the specialty pizza ID in the insert statement. Why not? It's an auto number. So auto numbers we don't include because they get generated for us. So the command to insert a pizza might look like something like this. Insert into table name, oh, it would be table name in this case, it would be specialty pizza, or specialty pizzas, I forget which one I used. A list of columns, enclosed in parentheses, separated by commas. A list of values, in parentheses, separated by commas. For string values, there's quotes around them. For numeric values, there's not. For dates, I think there are pound signs. 
Here's the good news, though. We don't need to know that. All right? I mean, it would be good if you knew that, right? But if we use the parameter object, the parameter object handles that for us. All right? So we don't have to worry about that. It does the formatting for us. Now, that would be to insert the same, that would be to insert California pizza over and over and over again. What do you suppose it's going to look like in our code? What's going to be different from that when we get to our code? Values are going to reference back to whatever is in the text box. Exactly. The values are going to get filled in. All right? We're going to get filled in from some place. All right? So therefore, they're going to be parameters, just like we had parameterized queries. Therefore, the parameters will be shown as question marks. That simply means any time in a SQL statement you have something that's going to get filled in at runtime, you use a question mark. Question. Do we have to include all the columns in a no. in an insert statement? No. You don't have to. Is that a problem? Sometimes. Yeah, maybe. When might it be a problem? When you need that information filled in? Yeah. Uh, if for one thing, if it's a required column and you don't include it, the insert won't work. All right? The other question is, is, well, what does the rest of your application do if that data is missing? If there's no discount for it, what happens? Hopefully, it doesn't blow up or cause issues or whatever. All right? But no, you don't have to include every column. All right? All right, what are ways that an insert statement can blow up? Not just this insert statement, but any insert statement. Yes? The wrong values included? Wrong values. Yes. Some wrong values, it will blow up. But not, I guess it depends on what you mean by wrong value. Yeah. Number one, wrong data as far as data types will cause it to blow up. Like if you have a string and you try to put it in a number, it'll blow up. All right? Um, so that's one case. All right? That's one instance where it will blow up. All right? Of course, there would be basic syntax errors. Like there is no such column name that or there is no such um, table as that. If there's a mismatch between the columns and the values, if you had three columns and two values, it's going to blow up because it's not going to know what to do with one of them. Um, let's see, what else? Unique name. Unique name? Especially your pizza name is supposed to be unique yeah. and you put something in that's the same. Exactly. If I violate a constraint in the database, now remember what constraints are. There's a whole bunch of constraints. We actually talked about one, the data type. The other one is um, if we declare a field to be unique. For example, we made specialty pizza name a unique key. So therefore, every specialty pizza name has to be different. So if we put in two California pizzas, the second one would blow up. All right? If there are no values for something that is required, all right, so if that discount field was required and I didn't include it in the select, it would blow up. If image name was null and image name was listed as a required field, that could cause it to blow up. The other one that's a big one is referential integrity. So if I tried to insert a row into specialty pizzas 
and I put in a user ID that did not exist in the users table. I have enforced referential integrity on that. So I've defined a foreign key. And what that means is I can't put anything in this, in this table where the user ID or user info ID doesn't match the user info ID in the user info table. So if I tried to put in, I think I have two user IDs, one and two. If I tried to put in a user ID of 10 or 40 or something like that, it would blow up because it doesn't correspond to any user in the user info table. So there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Which one of them, which one of these things that could go wrong do we want to plan for? I would say this is an easy question to answer. All of them. All right. Um, yeah. Now, there's even more things that could go wrong. All right. What if since the time you wrote your program, someone went and renamed the table in the database? Or what if someone was maintaining the database and it was exclusively open? Or what if in, in different sorts of databases, not necessarily access, but your database server had crashed? These are all things that you can't possibly code to prevent from happening, right? You'd love to, but you can't, right? So when I say plan for, I don't mean prevent. I mean you want to be able to handle it if it happens, all right? There's a couple ways that we can we can, uh, there's a couple ways that we can um, plan for or address errors. One of them is by um, sort of keep them from happening. All right? So these three fields are all required. Well, we can make, the, we can put validation on our entry screen to make sure that someone puts in a pizza name someone puts in an image name, and someone puts in a user info ID. We can put validation in there. So we can, and I'm using the word prevent loosely, because there's nothing we can do to 100% prevent an error. Let me give you an example. Let's say in a horrendous streak of bad luck, I'm entering a pizza for myself that I've created. At the same moment, I am fired and I'm deleted from the user table, all right? I may have selected myself in the user input table, and it might have been valid when I, when I started entering it, but at that split second when human resource fires me and security's coming to drag me out the door, all right, they may have deleted me from that. And in that split second, if I hit save, I would get an error. So I could put validation in there, but with crazy unusual circumstances, um, you could still get an error despite the validation. But face it, validation is going to control many of those things. So some errors we can more or less prevent. But there's some errors that we can't even really plan on and are totally unpredictable. Like how could you predict that someone is going to be maintaining the database at any point in time? What code can you put in to prevent that? All right, there's nothing you can really do. In which case, what we want to do is we want to have it blow up, but have it blow up nicely. All right, don't simply crash with an ugly error where the user has no idea what happened and no idea what to do to fix it or anything like that. We want to display a user-friendly error message, in other words. So there's some things we can't prevent, but we can make sure, we can test to see if the operation succeeded or not. And if the operation didn't succeed, we can display a user-friendly error saying, hey, um, you know, that insert didn't work. I'll give you an example of that. Specialty pizza name has to be unique, all right? It would actually be more trouble than it's worth to write the code to validate that, in my humble opinion. So you know what? I'm going to let them try to enter it. The database is going to catch it, and I'm just going to display a user-friendly error if they enter in a duplicate uh, pizza name. All right? Now, there's some that might disagree. There's some that might say, well, you could write code to validate that. Yeah, that's true, but that's the approach I'm going to take. 
because it's easier, in my mind, to let the database do its job and reject that bad data and just display a user-friendly error message than me trying to write some sort of convoluted code that's going to go and check and blah, blah, blah. All right? Could do it either way, but I'm going to take this approach. All right. We'll cover more examples of this as we go further um, with this. Now, there's one thing about the insert and this particular insert that caused me to want to do this the manual way, and that is the user ID. The user ID is not something that is going to be keyed in, right? It's going to be entered based on your session variable, all right? So anytime you have data that's going to come from somewhere else other than being entered in, uh, that's a reason to maybe do it the custom way. And I'll tell you why. Using a details view, for example, for an insert works great and is very simple if everything's going to be keyed in. For example, the toppings table. Everything's going to be keyed in. There's nothing that's automatically going to get filled in other than the key and the database handles that. So there's no reason not to do the toppings with a, a, a details view. With this one, though, there's one field that we don't want to key in. It's going to come from somewhere else. And where could it come, it come from? It could come from a session variable. It could come from a query string. It could come from anywhere. So anytime you have data going into the database that comes from somewhere other than being keyed in, that's a tip off in my mind. I might want to just custom code this guy. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. All right, we'll probably get through this example, but I don't know if it's going to be pretty. And it might not have validation and so on, but at least we'll get through it. So let me get into my ad page, ad pizza page. some labels. So we have a text box for the first thing, which is especially pizza name. For the second thing, which is image name, which I don't think I made required. We're not going to worry about the image right now. Ideally, we would probably at some point uh, make it so that you could upload the image here. All right, we're not going to worry about that today. And then I'm going to have a button. Again, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, I, this is not a pretty page, but it will get the job done. So I'm going to set this label to say name. And set, to, set this label to say image name. I'm going to go here and call this text box, text box name. And I'm going to call this text box image name. All right. So I, now I need to code when the button gets clicked. 
All right, guess what? This is going to look a lot like the login code. Only difference being that we're not creating a select statement, we're going to create an insert statement. And we're not going to read the data, we're going to perform an update. But parts of this are going to be the same. You think this is going to be the same? Absolutely. We're still connecting to the same database. So setting up our connection string is going to be the same. Select command. We don't have a select command, right? We have a insert command. And I'm going to write my insert statement. Insert into specialty pizza. Specialty pizza name, comma, image name. Comma, user info ID. Values question mark, question mark, question mark. Those get filled in at runtime. Now, you might think, why can't I just put the value right there if I know what it is? Why don't I just concatenate that on the string? Well, the reason we don't do that is that the um, SQL parameter object is very powerful. All right? Um, there's some hitches with the values. What if, what if my... Um, what if a value contains a quote? That's really going to confuse SQL because it's going to see a quote and think that it's the end of the value. And it might cause it to blow up. All right? That sometimes gets exploited by hackers. All right? In what's called a SQL injection attack. Has anyone ever heard of a SQL injection attack? Let's Google it. Here's where someone tries to create the insert statement in the way that I just said we could try by putting the values right as part of the SQL statement and not using the parameter statement. However, if you give a goofy value like this, then it's liable to change the SQL statement and add on to it. For example, in this case, they use something to drop a table, to simply get rid of a table by putting the appropriate value into the username field. What does that mean? It means your values need to really be scrutinized. All right. You can either do that scrutinizing, but believe me, it's not easy. All right. Back in the old days, even before um, I was aware of SQL uh, injection, just to handle all the different possibilities, I wrote a little uh, routine to sort of clean the data uh, input that came in to a SQL statement. 
And it wasn't straightforward. All right? Thankfully for us, we have the parameter object. The parameter object does a lot of the work for us. So the point is, is use these parameter objects. All right? So, I'm going to add a parameter for specialty pizza. And it's going to come from text box name. I'm going to add a parameter for image name. And it is going to come from text box image name. And finally, I need a parameter for every one of the question marks. So the ID is going to come from the session variable. And I'm just going to look up the session variable name. that I store the ID in. That gives me an error. Why does it give me an error? Because I can put anything in a session variable. It doesn't know it's a string, so I can simply say dot to string. All right, I don't need any of these readers because I'm not reading any data. That's another way that a query is more complicated than an insert. An insert either works or doesn't. It's not going to like insert some of the fields and not the others. The whole thing succeeds or the whole thing fails. All of the insert updates and deletes work that way. It's not going to do part of a statement. All right? So with a SQL query, my results could vary from I could get an error, I could get no data, I could get a bunch of data. With SQL inserts, I only get one thing. It works or it doesn't. If it works, it inserts the row. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. All right. So I simply need to go and execute the insert statement. And the way you do that is by saying objds dot insert. All right. Pretty easy, right? This is a case where the, the long way around really, at least for an example like this, isn't that long of a way around. All right. So let's run this and make sure that it works. But first, I'm going to do one more thing. When I'm done, I'm going to redirect them back to the list. How do you do that? Response, redirect, list.aspx. So, taken here. I can add the California pizza. I don't think image name is required, so I'm going to skip it. I'm going to click the button to save it. And boom. Wow. We have a problem. No value is given for one or more than one parameters. Usually when you do that, it is because 
Well, a couple of reasons. I could have misspelled something, but in this case, I see I've given a parameter for image name twice, and I didn't give the user info ID. So I have to fill in all the parameters with something. So let's try this again. image. We have a winner. If it ever tells you something like that, it means that um, you're missing uh, a column name. You have a column name spelled or whatever. Or you don't have the right number of parameters or the right kind of parameters. Now, um, what was I going to say here? That kind of error you should clean up, where it's just flat out a syntax error, right? So um, ultimately, we're going to have logic that's going to catch any kind of error. But those syntax errors, you know, you got to make sure that the code works. All right, one more time. pizza, especially pizza ID, especially pizza name, pizza image, user info ID, specialty pizza, especially pizza name, pizza image, user info ID. Sensitive. Let me double check and make sure that indeed is an auto number field. It is. Short text, short text. You have to specify which table you're inserting the info ID to. <coughs> yeah. A... Especially pizza. Um, special T pizza ID. Like, like user. Like for user info, would you have to say specialty pizza dot user info ID? No, because I'm only inserting into one table. Okay. So there's only one table that's in play. So specialty pizza. Ah, no, oh, no, that's right. Specialty pizza name. We'll be 
J and it is text box name, not text box pizza name. It is text box name. That would give us a compile error. That wouldn't give us a runtime error if it couldn't find the object. If I had planned this in advance right now, I'd have Huffman burst in the room, <laughs> dressed as Darth Vader, and like do the force choke on me and say, you'll never get this done, Obi-Wan Zellers. And, uh, and uh, it would make for a, a classic moment in, in CISS teaching. I honestly don't Jim, know. The reason why I'm asking if you put the specialty pizza ID because it's creating a new so it would automatically generate it for you? Yes. You just wouldn't, like up in that first line where it's right. insert, wouldn't you put specialty pizza ID so that it would create no. a new auto number? No. Just the fact that you're doing an insert creates a new row and generates a new auto number. You don't need to put the ID in. I don't know what's wrong. All right. I will take a look at this. Pardon me? Well, that's a good question. Is it supposed to be a... Oh, I like that. So how do I make it an integer? That could be it. I'm making it a string, and I'm trying to put it... That could... Yeah, that might be. Um, into... How do I make an integer? Int dot something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Integer that first. Why? Why am I taking this? Let's just Google it. <laughs> C sharp convert string to int. convert to int thirty. Session IDs are weird because you can store a you can store anything in a session ID. Therefore, a session ID returns, I believe, an object. So I have to tell it to treat that object like an integer. Okay. I think if this is right. Let's uh, let's try this. Either it will work or it won't. If it won't work, if it don't work, then I will work on this and post the answer. If it does work, then we'll call it a day. Right. Yeah, it needs a string there. It doesn't matter what type it is, it needs a string. Yeah. 
It does. So. Build failed. Uh oh. Drive. Shot one more time. Okay, so it's there. I can look at the data source. I can look at the insert command. Okay, there is the insert statement. I can look at the insert parameters. Ah! What? What's the problem? Okay, what is the problem? Insert parameters. How many insert parameters are, does it say there are? You might need good eyes or be sitting close to see this. Zero. Does that make sense to you? Mm -mm. No. So what's wrong? <coughs> Select parameters. Should say insert parameters. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question. How long did I stare at this and make zero progress? We can actually go back to the to the recording and view how long it was. How long did it take me to find it when I went into debug? Thirty seconds. Yeah, 30 well, seconds. two minutes. I'll be generous. All right. So, what does that tell you? Even for experienced developers, staring at your code doesn't work. All right. No, it doesn't. It's gonna and if it does work, it's gonna take a really long time. All right. So. All the 
of different things that we randomly tried. And you know what happens? I was at least smart enough, thank goodness, for when I, when I tried something and it didn't work, I restored it back to where it was before. What sometimes I have done is, like, you'll make a change thinking it will work, it doesn't work, you leave it at the wrong thing. You don't change it back because it was never wrong in the first place. You know what I mean? So that's one way that you can really create a mess for yourself. And there's California pizza, yes. Thank you, thank you. All right, that's good. You don't know how things, you don't know how things like that just piss me off. Right? <laughs> so, uh, the, the point is, you know, uh, is, is learn a lesson from it. And I'm saying this for me as much as I'm saying it to you, right? If something goes wrong, you know, follow good procedures. Don't stare at the code, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter how much you think the force is on your side, all right? Pat. Instead, go and use the systematic tools that you have available to debug it. In our case, it's the debugger. All right, we'll see you in lab.